時をかける希望を恐竜戦隊ジュレンジャー Hey everyone, welcome to Chojin Chumps. I'm John and I'm here with my brother Jay. Hello, hello everyone. So today we will be diving into episode three and four of Zayu Ranger Fight in the Land of Despair and Reawaken Legendary Weapons. So we're going to treat this uh, these two, this two parter as one episode and just discuss it all in one go. So the Rangers, it starts off with the Rangers training, but their weapons keep breaking, like straight up. Breaking, yes. And I, I just want to say, I love it when you have rangers sparring. I love it when you see them like that. It's not just a natural thing that they're constantly working, constantly getting better. You know I mean, in in Power Rangers, all you got is maybe Jason working out. You know what I mean, you got them doing their hobbies in America. This one, they're training. It feels like a, you know, what I mean, there's a purpose, a greater purpose. And and it's comical. Because as they're training seriously, their their weapons are just straight up crapping out on them. May pulls back her bow, and it looks like someone sawed it in half because it just folds. Um, Geki's sword breaks when it's struck. Uh, I can't remember about the axe and the daggers, but I'm pretty sure they just crapped out just as bad, you know? Um, let, let me ask you, though. Do you think this is a... Uh... Crappy weapons, old weapons, or do you think, like, on a certain level, these rangers are stronger? And so, like, because it is still a metal sword. You know, I mean, these are all like, like, it, it's easy to say, you know, I mean, the bow folding in half, you know, I mean, is comical, but to actually break a bow takes a lot of effort. So, I'm honestly kind of curious if these guys are just naturally a bit stronger because they are, they are knights, they are these ancient warriors. I don't know. That's the hard thing because. The way they break seems to indicate some sort of time, like they basically rotted away, and yet the people themselves were fine. And so I don't get it. Like I want to say it makes the most sense for the weapons just to have been crappy, because up to this point we have not seen them display super strength really, outside of, um, outside of battle or, or in it, because hell. They're still having trouble fighting putties at this point. So, and, and in all fairness, I think even in Jetman, like one of the more more impressive feats of strength that we saw was like uh, when the Black Ranger guy actively jumped in front of a truck and stopped it himself. And so, but that even that came super late in the series. So who knows? You're right. It's, uh, it's just no. Too remember, old. in Jetman, it showed it right off the bat. They got hit by birdonic waves. Real word. Uh, they got hit by the Burdonic waves and immediately got super strength. So Akko jumped and beat the like Olympic hurdle. Um, what else? Uh, that was the most obvious one. I think Guy, yeah, he did stop a truck, but I think he also did other stuff that he shouldn't have been able to do. He he decked a dude who went flying. Yeah, right that was it. Super far. Oh yeah, okay, I remember that. But yeah, you know I mean, but I, I'm those are. You know what? No, those are, especially Akko's, it's hard to ignore that one. But, you know what I mean? Like, guy sending someone flying, yeah, it was super far, but compared to stopping a truck. But either way, no, yeah, it's something that, at this point, we're not going to know, because we don't, we haven't seen them too much. The whole, like we said before, episode one and two was pretty much just Bandora flexing on, on the world. It's, big bad Bandora is back, let me move your buildings, let me blow shit up. And let me tell you why you don't belong here. Right. So they determine they need new weapons. And then it shifts focus to a kid and his mom. I think the kid's name, was it Hiroshi? Yeah. Yeah. So Hiroshi comes home and he wants to do what all kids want to do. He wants to go play with his friends, have a snack. And his mom's like, you have to study. You got 30 out of 100. So if my kid got 30 out of 100, I'd be like, you have to study too. But uh, he goes to his room, sulking, and he wishes his mother would disappear. Yeah, I, I put a, I straight up just put a, 
I just put Labyrinth because if anyone who's seen the movie Labyrinth, I know that might be dated in 2020, but literally it's it's a emo teenager looking at her crying <laughs> little brother and being like, I wish the Goblin King came and took you. Yeah, it, it's just a classic. It's just a classic thing of like the child wishes this person who's just being responsible and looking out for him away because they just want to be a child. But but here's the thing. And I, I mentioned this earlier, but Bandora is listening, and Bandora goes, "Oh, it's so tough. Kids have to study all the time today. Shall we help them?" <laughs> and she makes his mother fall into a weird portal, and the kid, he, he falls in too. And we see a pattern because about three different times now, whenever Bandora was involved. And I, I, I hope we're going to see this more. Whenever Bandora was involved, it's always her giving them something in theory they should want, but in a terrible way. The astronauts, she's like, let me help you. And she sends them back to Earth, except she sends them flying through space. So who knows if they even made it. Um, this kid, same thing. He made a wish, and her wish essentially backfires. And it kind of fits with this evil witch magic thing she has going on. It's it's the classic thing that everyone kind of puts with magic, because yeah, I mean, magic in so many ways are is the easy solution, and so in folklore, it's like you don't want to be taking the easy solution. That's why you have the monkey paw, or or the jins who are the jins who are, yeah, you know I mean, I'll grant you your wish, but yeah, you know I mean, it's not going to be what you want. It's always been a plot in magic, but like we said before, Bandora was so. As Rita Repulsa, the most we saw her do was make my monster grow. She's super active here, which I absolutely love. And so to see her being not just, oh, I have a headache and I just look at the rangers and it pisses me off that they're happy. Let me create a monster and throw it down. No, it's her actively just being a bad person, being a witch. It's just yeah, her it, being it, a witch. It's something you also saw in Jetman, too where they're watching them and choosing to actively intervene in human affairs in a way that's both ironic and kind of uh, dickish, and I love it. Um, then it goes back to the Rangers, who are now around their big book o history. And it's revealed that there are some legendary weapons hidden in the land of despair that, when combined will unleash incredible power. So one, I'm stoked, because I'm already like, it's it's their regular weapons that they're going to combine into their super gun thing. Awesome. However, uh, Barda uh, gives out some warnings. The land of despair, if you feel sad, you'll turn stone. If you uh, take too long in there, you'll turn to stone. Uh, I, I just want to point out, though, because let me ask you, I, I know it's been a couple of days since you saw the episode, but um, do you remember uh, when they opened up their book where it said the weapons came from? No. It said the weapons were taken from the bodies of a dragon. Hmm. And let me ask you, th does that does that mean anything to you? Do you, do you think... I'm sure there's some Japanese legends that has that concept, but I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm I'm not even going Japanese. I'm talking about like in terms of Power Rangers, dragon. When I hear dragon, I think Serpentera, but I also, I mean, or the Dragon Zord, obviously. But uh, and, and that and that's what I'm kind of getting at because as as this series has done, the Zords aren't just machines; they're sentient beasts. They are the they are the legendary beasts. They are actual living things and play a role in this world and so for the legend of these weapons to come from a body of a dragon and we know for a fact there's a dragon zord i'm just wondering if like 20 episodes down the line or whatever whenever we know he's gonna show up i i'm i'm wondering if like this is already like early sowings of like this discord that that can come about it i don't know but that's a good catch um i'm interested to find out um, however, real quick, maybe you can shine some light on this. I have no idea why I wrote this, because it's been a, a, a little bit since I watched the episode. But I wrote 
clear power structure. Uh, can you think of anything I was referring to? Yeah, because I actually wrote, because um, uh, I quoted this, it's Geki, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Because, like you said, Bandora warns them. Bandora plainly let, lays it out where it's like, this land is going to kill you. It will turn you to stone. Please come. Be because, well, also she tells him, you know I mean, I put the kid and his mom there. Basically, back them in a corner. But before they before they even decide, um, I think it was Goshi, the, the Black Ranger. But either way, as you will see time and time again, they turn to the Red Ranger. They turn to Geki, their leader, their Red Ranger leader. And they're like, what do we do? They, they full on ask him. They, they ask, how should we approach this? How are we doing this? Is it worth doing? And he's the one who makes the call. And so I think maybe that's what you're referring to because I, I think it's, so. it's definitely something that wasn't really there in, in Jetman at all. And Jetman, the one who got the final say was the commander. Yeah, she sent them on missions. But um, you never had a clear leader in the hierarchy like you did this. And since I've already seen the next episode, oh, we've both seen the next episode, since I've seen uh, episode five, I know a little bit more, and so I can tell you this, it's interesting, because as much of a cohesive unit this seems to be, they can really undermine it in different ways. So I'm excited to get to that in a bit. Um, but you're right. So Bandora does this thing where she, like, appears before them. Was it on a TV screen? Or no, it was just... She just projects herself. Yeah. She just, so she like, shows a phantom image of herself. So she projected herself in and tells them, hey, uh, I sent this kid here. The move's on you. And they're like, now we have to go and get it. Well, and, and a, part of, a part of why she did it, which they are fully aware of already, is that you have uh, a day. It's yeah. just 24 hours, right? Yeah. Because there's, here's the thing about the land of despair. If you feel despaired, you turn to stone. However, if you're there for more than 24 hours, by default, you will turn to stone. So while there's already going to be struggles to get to the place in general, imagine the throwing in a child who's just going to be running around screaming, not sure where he is. That's already something that the Rangers are going to have to take time to handle. It. I, I just put that it's like, it is just so cool to have what I feel is this really competent villain. Yeah, she raises the stakes. Yeah, Bandora is always she's not playing around. You know I mean, I specifically sent these kids here because I'm gonna I want to make sure y'all perish here. And yeah. in all fairness, in all fairness, um, something we glossed over, which I don't think is gonna have too big of an effect, but it, it, they also say, I mean, these weapons are are dangerous to Bandora because people with magical powers will burn to death if they touch these weapons. So oh, yeah, yeah. she has incentive to be like, no, a hell no, they can't get these. But it's just so cool the way she's going about it. So now we go back to Bandora. And I just have Plepricon being grumpy, and God help me, I love it. I'm never not going to love sassy Plepricon, especially with that name. But he makes Dora Minotaur. And as far as it goes, as far as enemies goes, Pretty cool. It's just a standard Minotaur. It looks like it could be from Clash of the Titans, you know? Uh, and then it shifts focus again to the Rangers in uh, the Land of Despair. And they are traveling in circles and seeing mirages. Dan is particularly affected. And it causes him to fall down a fucking hill. And that's when the Minotaur attacks. And it's cool. Right. Mm -hmm. I will say this though because like to me this kind of gives like you said we haven't had those moments of just seeing the rangers and kind of picking up on their personalities it's it's these small moments that I pick at because they're going around and Don the blue ranger I, I said this in the first one where I'm like I mean he's the one reading the book during the serious situation laughing at the book he's not taking it serious and in this one he's he's being childish he's like being mopey about it I'm tired I'm thirsty he is just laying into these how they portray them in these downtimes that shows yeah don as far as i is going to be that childish one he's going to be the michelangelo of the group he's going to be the the one that 
and and that's where Goshi comes in because Goshi, the the Black Ranger, is stern with him. He's very much like Don. Look, we can't do nothing now. We have to keep moving. Yeah, he's clearly a Donatello. Yeah, and and so that's the thing. It's gonna be these, and and I'll bring them up as we go along because they're so easy to miss. But to me, they paint these characters because. I, like you said, we haven't had any outright moments with these guys yet, but from the slight interactions they've shown, I can see, okay, Don's going to be that child one. He's going to be the one that that does, like, the rash impulse. He's going to be the one that is going to hop to something too quick. He's going to be trouble. He's, it's it's youth. That's the problem. Yeah, and we, we see that again. We'll, we will see that later. Um, that being said, I I think we also gloss over it. When they got there, didn't they separate? Did they oh, send? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, they sent boy. boy and May, um, off to, uh, find Hiroshi. So at this point, we're in episode three, right? We have yet to see them all take on a task together so far, because every time they've managed to have to split up for various reasons. Um. Yeah. The closest we got was when they all came together to fight uh, Dora Skeleton. Mm-hmm. But again, but they again, always, it was make, it a, they always May, make a point to split boy, them up first. Go, go get the kids. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, they they always make it a point to keep the team fractured to a degree. So, uh, yeah, Dora Minotaur shows up, and it's kind of cool how he shows up because he you just see horns coming underground, just kind of zooming around shark like, and then it rams into uh down and then the minotaur is there and it's like i said it's just a minotaur with a club regular dude um and he just beats their asses uh it's goshi geki and uh dan who are fighting him and he's even though they're not morphed he's winning uh meanwhile uh boy and may then run into putties while looking for Hiroshi. And this is the coolest use of the morphers I've seen. Again, while they're fighting, they use the morpher as brass knuckles. Oh, I put, uh, I, I legitimately wrote down, <laughs> I, I wrote down, oh, brass knuckles buckles. <laughs> like, legit, like, look, dude, I, I think every person has that moment where they're playing around and they pick up an innocent object and just think, like, how can I do the most damage with this? It's like when you wrap your watch around your knuckles as if that <laughs> makes it brass knuckles. So yeah, holding the bucklers like that and just using them as brass knuckles and just beating beating their enemies. I was down. I, I enjoyed it. So uh, then they encounter Gryphazor, right? Yeah, which... Uh, because they at first they spot Hiroshi. Yeah. Um uh No, actually no, my bad. I'm jumping ahead because Griffizor just enters and they immediately are like, oh shit, we have to morph. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm asking. So Griffizor was encountered by uh Geki and them or by No nope, Boy Boy and May. Okay. So yeah. Which Griffizor was interesting appears. because it which was interesting just because for us um, anyone who watches Power Rangers, when you think of Gryphazor going at a ranger, you think red you think red. So yeah, I was very much like already like, oh, how is this going to work out? I, I will say I was excited and legitimately scared isn't the right word. Anxious. Because I'm like, you know for a fact they can't take him on. The only one who could even had a, have a chance at the beginning was Geki and even then, not really. Um, so you're seeing these dual fights where it then goes back to the Minotaur and he breathes fire at them. And so at that point, the other three have to morph. And they use their ranger guns and it just bounces off. And I said this before, um, but the ranger guns seem really like insignificant. Like, like it's just a holdover just to get them to better weapons. And that kind of disappoints me because... Like, I feel like if that's what you're going to go with, then maybe have just a better weapon to begin with and then have them upgrade it. Kind of like Jetman, you know? Yeah, but the ultimate truth, and this is always going to be the business aspect, is uh, 
hey, let's make them something to sell. Yeah, but... I, and that's the thing, dude. That No, I agree. In the story context, it's already a dead weapon after the second episode. Yeah. I mean, e- even when they were going into combat normally, they did, they kind of preferred their own weapons, their own steel weapons besides the ranger sword, ranger gun. It, it just hasn't really connected with them. I mean, even when you think back to Power Rangers, like your experience with Power Rangers, I don't recall the guns much either. Yeah. I remember their weapons and their and the final blast. So yeah, it doesn't surprise me, but no, I agree. We're just like it's kind of disappointing that episode two this is already useless that that being said though i do like the fights we see a lot of backflips a lot of regular flips and we didn't see that with jetman jetman had a completely different style of fighting and you don't really see it with power rangers all that much either um in my mind so here we get to see a different style of fighting particularly and specifically because of the storyline they're going with because these are like prehistoric rangers, you know? Um, and Jetman, and this is a thing with cinema in general. This is why John Wick got praised so much because what action scenes like to do are camera cuts. It's, we're going to cut, we're going to cut to different aspects of the fight to give it the, to give it kind of like a more dynamic to think that there is even more movement than what there is. Yeah. But really like for anyone who actually hones in and watch the fight, it's not doing anything, and it, all it is is being used to mask pe- you typically people who can't fight. Um, in Jetman, what they did was they did camera cuts, so you see the people launching themselves. Like I know uh, you saw like Akko, who's a move she did was she do all these flips around the enemies, but you didn't see her do flips. You saw the camera cut in front of the enemy, she's hopping around to the back of the enemy, she's hopping around. This you actually get full scenes. For a good chunk of it, you get full scenes of actions, which is clearly different, and it clearly adds way more weight to it all. You you feel like you're watching, you're watching a whole experience here, not just what the director wants you to see. Yeah. Um. So that's refreshing. That's nice. Then ag- again, we shift back to uh, Boy and May and Gryphosaur, and Hiroshi has managed to get himself in like this quicksand and again they raise the stakes so this boy is in danger and Gryphosaur is basically standing between uh them and him in fact at one point i think he literally holds may back from him and it's cool to see because you have this sense of urgency you have this sense of danger and so when eventually may pulls him out uh, while Boy is getting owned by Griff, it's a feeling of success, even though the danger is still there. But I will say, um, something that I caught up in in the earlier episodes, and, and I'm bringing it up now because I didn't, I didn't say anything before, is Griffasaur not going to talk? Because when you think of Goldar, Goldar is very vocal. You remember Goldar's voice. He he was just as vocal as anyone else on the, on, on she, he was just as vocal as Greta, and so this is episode three. He's gotten the most action out of everyone besides Bandora. He's been in almost every Ranger fight, and all we've heard is roaring. We haven't heard him talk. I... So at this point, I'm, I'm I'm wondering is he just like more animalistic? Is he not going to have a voice? And and if he does, then what do you think about that? Um. I don't want to give too much away. Um, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, here's the thing. You're right. I'm not sure if he does talk, and I honestly want him to. But you're right. I think it might be a more animalistic thing because we, it's uh, again three episodes in, and he hasn't said a single word, and yet he's and yet, been like so active too. Yeah, and then we get. I, I'll just spoil a brief thing in the next episode. So in the next episode, there's a scene uh, where Rita and them are celebrating. And you see everybody dancing in a circle and just being goofy. And then in the corner is Gryphazor asleep. And it comes off as very 
like you said, animalistic, almost like he has his purpose. He'll fight, but almost like a dog, you know? Well, see, you bring that up, and actually, that's something I glossed over, because I think in episode two, when we first see Rita in her base, the uh, book of back in Top, t- top Tap? Pop top Tap? Pat. Tote Pat, sorry. Um, <laughs> top, top. Look, man, for, for, for dyslexic, this name is going to be hell. But, but both of them are squabbling with each other, and literally, Griffizor is just snapping in the corner. And so I... But I kind of glossed over that because it was such a quick thing. But, yeah, it's just, I don't know. I, like, a part of me, again, I want him to talk, but a part of me also thinks it's incredibly cool if uh, if he's this beast. Yeah, dude, there's something just cool about, like, animalistic enemies that, that don't run off of emotions. They run off of just instinct and base. You know what I mean? Yeah. Instinct and conflict, man. It's such a cool thing. I love those type of characters. I mean, Kenpachi Zaraki, I loved it. I mean, you have these characters, and so to see if they bring, if they make Grif- Griffors or that, I'm going to be kind of disappointed, but I'm also somewhat going to be satisfied too. I'm a fickled, <laughs> I'm a fickled, fickled man. <laughs> All right. Um, so at that point, getting back to the episode, Bandora, I found this interesting because rather than Mighty Morphin, where it's at the end and they got, the monster got his ass beat. Bandora calls on the ground spirits to make her monster grow. They're they're not in danger. The monster hasn't lost or anything. She's just like, fuck these guys in particular. And Dora Minotaur grows huge. And so for the first time, the gang has to summon their zords on their own. Real quick though, before we get any further than that, do you remember how she she makes them grow? I remember she calls on the sp- spirits of the ground. She doesn't call on the spirits of the ground. She calls on the demons. Did I, she? I put, dude, I full on put on my note, bitch calls for demons. Like, I know she's talked to Satan before. Uh, but I, I swear she, in the translations they used for me it was spirits. I don't know, maybe it was one of those dual translations where in this point she used spirits and this point she used demons. Yeah, you know I mean how sometimes translate all I know is because that stuck with me where I'm like, dude, she called for demons. It's not make my monster grow. It's hey, hey demons, it's your girl. <laughs> do do me a solid. I, I will say this, she is much more connected to evil than Rita ever was. Um Oh yeah. Dude, I, I, again, very early on, this is only episode three, I gotta say, she's stealing the show. I'm absolutely loving every time Mandora's coming on the screen. But either way, let, let's get back to it, let's get back to it. They're called the Beast. Yeah, so they call the Beast, and we get to see a Zord fight with actual individual Zords and actual powers. So I wrote it down, you got Tricera Cannon, you got the Saber Beam, uh, even though uh, the Minotaur shot it right back. You got Mammoth Blizzard and Tricera Pool. So it was cool to see these three Zords actually get use as opposed to just just becoming the Megazord. And, and also, um, in last episode, you had the Tyrannosaurus having its own special finishing move, yeah, too. Yeah, Tyrannosonic. So like, yeah, so like, it just seems really cool. Um, I The only one I actually recall them using in America was the Blizzard, the the mammoth blizzard every once in a while i recall that one and maybe the horns but yeah i think and this might just be censorship because i don't recall any of the guns i don't recall the tail gun or the horse or the horn horn guns here's the weird thing we could have we can't even say that for certain in the sense of i'm pretty sure the tricera horn thing is in the opening of the um of the episodes, you know, the entrance. However, yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean it was used in the show. Oh, no. But I, I, another thing I want to point out, though, is, um, like we said before, these Zords are sentient. They're guardian beasts. They're not yeah. even called Zords. Because um, when the Pterodactyl came in, it saved May. Um, do you remember that? No, I don't remember... Because, like, May was uh, in trouble. She, I think Griforzor was about to 
sink her sink his teeth into her because she's the one with the child now. Yeah. And it full on it flies in and blasts Griforosaur in, in the group. Like it actively saved her. And so because because that's something I brought up. Yeah, it blasted Griforosaur and that dude shrugged it off. I put Griforosaur gives no fucks because he just tanked it. Which is both cool and daunting because Again, man, this is going to be that mountain. This is going to be that thing they have to overcome. Because, dude, he takes a blast from a Megazord, not trans, not grown, and just like, okay, next. I, I definitely want to see him go up against Gray. <laughs> um, that being said, uh, Hiroshi is still freaking out, and he despairs. He's afraid his mom is dead, and he turns to stone. And that's where the episode ends. So, real quick, before we get into it, I want to say, in our last episode, when I was talking about uh, the actors, I mentioned how I thought May was very flat. I'm happy to say, in this one, she's a lot less flat, but they gave her more to do. So, yeah, even though she has that deadpan face in the entrance, uh, I'm interested to see where she goes, especially since of the characters we've seen, she has been one of the ones who've had more lines. Um, I, I I get the feeling, and this is just something that, it's not just Japanese cinema that does this, uh, America is just guilty, where they make the females the cornerstone of the emotional aspect. You know what I mean? Where they're going to be the emotional ones in the group. But I'm going to say this, um, just from Jetman alone, yeah, Everyone's a bit emotional. Like, Sentai hasn't had a problem of, of making women, giving the women actresses a range of characters. Because while, like, obviously... You, we've uh, only seen one Sentai, so we can't exactly say that. Nope, I am basing all my knowledge off. No, yeah, but I would just say from Jetman, on one aspect, yeah, the most emotional... Actually, no, I'd say it was a toss-up between the most emotional being either the male lead character or the female lead character, while the most badass is either is the argument could be made either it's this male character guy or the female commander. Yeah, I mean, I think... Time out. Yeah, the most emotional one was Guy and you know it. He was always like two seconds away from riding off on his motorcycle in teenage angst, which is really impressive because he had to have been like 25. <laughs> you know what? fair maybe it's just some revisionist history in my mind but but no it's just something I'm, I'm willing to wait and see because they the women i've experienced in sentai haven't always been just the crying emotional ones and i want to see what may becomes as we go on but then again i want to see what they all becomes because as far as i know don is childish and geki's the leader <laughs> outside of that I'm just waiting to see where everyone else falls in line. All right. But so, hey, uh, final mm-hmm. thoughts on that episode, though. Like, just just from that episode, I want to say real quick, I love how organized the villains are because the heroes are already struggling. Like, it's not – there's so many times when right, right out the gates, it's like, well, yeah, once I morphed, of course you weren't going to stand a chance. Or it's like, of course, once I bust out this, this weapon, y'all don't stand a chance. This – felt good because bandora set the tone she set the stakes you're dancing to her tune and i just love having villains like this oh yeah um and i agree uh i i don't have too much in the way of thoughts on this because it's only halfway through the episode you know what i mean fair so taking it all all in um yeah you want to look at it as a whole i kind of broke it down it's still a two-parter well, I, like I said, I've said everything as I went along about the episode itself. Um, to sum it up at the end would require the other half. Um, which brings us to the next episode. Uh, it's revealed, it starts off with the basic recap, but it's revealed they have half a day left or they'll turn to stone. However, Bandora uh, reveals yet another issue that when night falls in the land of despair, it becomes freezing. So she calls back Dora Minotaur. And well, 
dude. You know, what? I'll let you finish your thought, and then I'm gonna say it. Go no, ahead. Go, go ahead and say it because I was gonna go on to the next point. Very much. This is just the plot line cop out. This is a little bit of plot armor because look, dude. If it's too cold that the Minotaur is going to freeze to death, mm-hmm. like, and the Rangers got by with just making a fire. You know, I mean, it was it was clearly something made to make sure that the Rangers don't lose at the moment. But no, to me, yeah, to right. me, yeah, to me, just kind of was. He's furry. <laughs> He's a furry, biggish monster. I, I, in my mind, I was like, dude, you'd be fine. You're wearing a fur coat. They're, they're not even shivering next to the fire. It's not like, but it was Pretty apparently sure were, but... okay. But either way, it's one of those things where it's just like. Clearly, this is like, okay, we got to make sure the plot continues. What's the reason to bring him back? Ah, screw it. It's too chilly, man. You don't, he, Bandora went, Bandora went grandma on that. Hey, you're not wearing a coat. Get your ass back inside. <laughs> so we, we have an interesting uh, situation because the Zords are sentient. And when the mentor leaves, they kick them out and force them to earn the weapons on their own because i think even dan was like oh cool we can use this to get to the castle yeah we'll just ride these bad boys through yeah no they were like see ya so then it goes to them being around a fire and let's see and we once again we see dan has the most character because he's complaining about the issue and goshi and geki are talking about what's going on and Goshi has to remind them all, you can't despair. You'll turn into rocks. Yeah, I I, I actually put that Goshi, in a way, kind of seems like a big brother-esque character. Mm-hmm. Where he's got that bit of sternness with him. Like, he will get after you for, for your own good. But it's also like, yeah, but if he can be softer about it. Because the way, he, the way Dan has been corrected before, this was very soft. This was very like, hey, man kind of tone it in look man this is where it is don't worry we're gonna get through this if it, it felt different i can see that i can see that um and then on the flip side we got the other two because boy and may is still separated yeah and it's interesting because boy comes off as practical he's like we need to regroup but may doesn't want to leave hiroshi and they eventually do have to leave him. And May promises uh, they'll be back. And I find that interesting because this is the second time we've seen Boy be really duty focused to the point where it's like, come on, man. You, he, he fucking threw daggers at Dan. He's willing to be like, come on, we have to leave this, this kid who, yeah. He's stone, and there's nothing they can do about it, but still should be more emotional, you know? Eh. <laughs> hey, man, look, I'll just say, this is, um, this is their sage's friend, and eh? <laughs> Look, look, man, I, I can't argue, I can't exactly put up too big of an argument when Boy or Bandora take a look at the situation and just say, fuck them kids. <laughs> like, this, because this dude, this kid... The whole reason, like, we know who he is and everything like that, and who has the connection to him is Barza. It's the sage Barza that knows the kid. Even you gotta remember that, the range, well, in all fairness, though, Rangers are still fresh out the pod, man. It's not like they've made these connections yet. But he, he, even then, he just lives in the same building that Barza man- manages, you know? Anyway. Like I, no, I agree, though. It's very much like, well, if you're the if you're a hero of justice, I kind of want a bigger emotion from you about this so uh dawn hits no monster and the three are suspicious that they're running in circles um and it's funny because don in his childishness he kicks a rock because he's frustrated and it goes straight into an invisible wall this is the next day by the way yeah we, we went through the night i'm not sure well that's why i said dawn hits Oh, dude, I thought you said Don. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were talking about... Because, look, dude, Japanese pronunciation of the name Dan is Don. <laughs> so, sorry. No, 
No, no, you're right. You're right. I <laughs> see the confusion. Dawn with a W. It's the rises. break of dawn. It's the break of dawn. Oh my god, what happened to him? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they they find an invisible wall and they literally break it down. <laughs> it's magic, but they can brute force it and break through it like a wall. And I absolutely love that. Dude, I absolutely love that there's nothing there. It's, you have a three actors miming a wall there. Because, look, I wrote down practical effects because sometimes that's just what you need. You don't need to construct or put the special effect. You don't need the shiny, glossy, uh, glowing hue that symbolizes something there. No, they just put their hands on to, like, something's here. And then they tackled the mofo, and all, they broke through into a whole different region. Cause yeah, now yeah bricks fall, literally fall through, and they're in a new area. Um. And they see the castle off in the distance, but a thunderstorm is blocking the way with lightning. Um, meanwhile, Boy and May reach a dead end, but lightning hits it, revealing a door that spits fire. No, no, no. They're the ones who face the lightning challenge. Because, because here's the thing. Yeah, maybe they saw the lightning when they went through, but we pan over to Boy and May, who, they're, it's just this open field with like destroyed statues and you see the scorch marks on the ground from where you know the lightning is hitting Uh and they're like and he says uh boy says i'm like this is probably one of the challenges we just gotta go for it and they do they run through what comes off as a minefield because you're getting these explosions like next to them close to them and they at the end of it they reach a brick wall that lightning crashes into and reveals a door with two handles and right. and yeah, and it's funny because boy picks the left handles, and this is like one of the cheapest magical. Is to me this is like the equivalent of the eye poke, <laughs> like in Three Stooges, because he opens the door and immediately just fire shoots out of it. It's in such a comical manner. It, it reminds me of the D and D traps that I can often set. <laughs> and so obviously they real quick close the door, and he hesitantly goes to the other one opens it, they go through, and yeah, then they all Yeah, they and up. they all reconvene. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then they reach a cave that apparently is the most difficult part. According to Bandora herself. Course, yeah. And I, I want to just say I, I like how Bandora has like all this knowledge despite us having our own sage that kind of doesn't have anything. <laughs> so far, Barza has not done shit that has been useful except wake them up. So... The great sage Barza is the equivalent of an alarm clock. Pretty much, right? Uh, when they enter, they find a sword. Goshi points this out. He's like, this sword uh, is evil. And has to be released. You you need to pull it out. Well, because there there's a little inscription on the tablet itself. Well, because first of all, Don, of course, Don being the reckless one is like, hey, legendary weapon. But yeah. but they but they pointed out like you Goshi said, Goshi, did. Goshi picks it up already because it's like, no, dude, there's, there's supposed, supposed to be five. five. There's just this huge saber here, and and that's when they uh, I think May draws attention to the inscription where it's just like. Hey, this is an evil sword. This is your final test. Remove the sword. And to which Dan's just like, I got this. Yeah, so he uh, he doesn't care. He grabs a sword. And I find it interesting. He seems to turn feral. He gets big fangs and eye makeup. Like, it was interesting. Um, they pry him off it, even though he's, like, trying to grab it and swing it at them. And he immediately says, he's like, I tried, but my mind was just filled with evil. So, of course, you know, Geki has to try. And sure enough, he pulls it out, but he's still feral. So he's swinging at everybody, but they grab him and convince him to let it go. Uh, Which I just, it feels like we're zooming through this, but there's not a lot to talk about in regards to it, you know? I, I actually... It's something that, like, towards the end of the episode, it really hits hard that it was just like, oh, wow, this was 
this went quick because like you said this is just it's not it's not a whole five minutes of a possessed ranger with an evil sword it's not a oh we actually have to battle him literally he's swinging the sword around all of them just come and tackle him and be and just tell him it's like hey hey man you're okay drop the sword we need you to drop the sword and he just snaps out of it it's not anything it's not a big character moment it's not really anything if anything i just put i i actually just wrote that it's like it's great to see everyone carry like everyone just immediately hopped on it because they're like oh, oh shoot he's in trouble and they all immediately hopped to action but it wasn't anything grand or big because immediately they just chuck the sword and it explodes yeah and explodes into the next area and this is i i found this super awesome it opens to the path uh it opens the path to the legendary weapons and bandora and her minions are already there and she won't let them take them she fucking freezes them in place pulls out the clock and she's like this is when you die (laughs) dude it it is so awesome because that's the thing we we knew she wasn't we knew there was going to be some kind of interference here but for her to show up herself and she she rolls deep she brought the whole squad dude i'm but not gonna her, lie i didn't know she was gonna interfere i expected dora titan i expected not titan uh mentor, mentor. i expected something else like that putties maybe but for her just to straight up appear and just snatch victory from them in that way to cheat essentially i i put i actually put like it's very practical man yeah it makes why sense are you gonna, why are you gonna waste your forces why are you gonna send out your fighters if literally all you if, if anyone who watches sports if all you gotta do is run down the clock why are you gonna give them a chance why are you gonna do anything to to risk put anything at risk man run down the clock she froze them yeah and, so, and, and in a cruelest manner, just like here's the clock, y'all are gonna die. But but right real quick, in front let of the weapons too. Uh-huh. Yeah, but let me ask you that because we're in front of the weapons, and immediately when I looked at them, I'm like, this doesn't seem right. And we'll learn the reason why. But did you catch on that when you first saw the weapons, like in in front of them? I didn't notice anything about them. You didn't notice? Mm-mm. Okay, well, we'll leave it be because it's gonna come up again very shortly. All right. But, but yeah, so they're we're in front of the weapons. And the rangers start turning to stone. And I, I thought this was funny because I always find it interesting how they use practical effects in these things. And it looks like just duct tape that's slowly being <laughs> duct taped around them. But then this was what was interesting to me. Geki having no other uh options kind of throws a Hail Mary and starts talking to uh, the legendary weapons, saying, you're meant to fight evil, um, come to us kind of stuff. And they do. They He manages to summon them. And I'm like, does that mean they're also semi-sentient? What, what? This magic bullshit takes everything to the next level. And it's interesting and leaves a lot of questions. But because they get the weapons, um, they fly, it flies to their hands. They are no longer stone. And so Bandora, of course, summons putties. And you get really good action shots of them using their new weapons. And in the group setting, it just feels epic. Yeah, the, the te- again, the techniques they use in just filming this. One thing I absolutely love when they do in martial arts film is when the camera is moving sideways with the guys. Mm-hmm. Because you're seeing their movement, and with, but with the camera going with you, it's not them like, because it's easy to just turn the camera to keep it focused on them. But when you move the camera with them, it gives a more dynamic feel to it all. So when the rain, when when Geki is running, because he did kind of do a little quick run to the side, and the camera went with them, it felt cool. And and dude, again, everyone has such unique choreography because these weapons are unique in of themselves. You're and not the obviously the bow and arrow person isn't going to be fighting like the sword user. Yeah, it, it and you all... saw May have to make room to actually use her bow. You know. Yeah, and like 
who had the heavier strikes? Obviously, the man wielding the axe, Goshi with his axe. You see him with broad strikes, broad strokes, and he flat out broke a putty's defense. Whereas Geki had, with his sword skill, had to open him up for the strikes. It was just really cool to see these different dynamics, and it worked so, so well. I loved it. So, a lot happened in this last five minutes. <laughs> yeah, so, it it's going to be kind of glossing over some stuff. But Bandora gets pissed. <laughs> she gets real pissed. And something I've never seen happen before. And I absolutely, it blew my mind. Bandora grows giant and picks up the land of despair in and of itself and shakes it like a Polaroid picture. Well, because I know we glossed over this. The land of despair is just a floating island in the middle of this, like, off this separate dimension. There's nothing around it. There's nothing. It's not just like she's picking an island out of the water or anything. But it is. She's holding a whole island in this in this dead space. And she's just like, literally taking matters into her own hands. Because she's just like, uh-uh, I'm going to destroy you. So as they're all fighting, Gryphazor sends a fire blast revealing Hiroshi's mom. Yeah, Dora- reve- revealing the side plot. <laughs> yeah, revealing the side plot. Dora Minotaur attacks and May is sent to get Hiroshi's mom out of there. Uh... Uh, they transform after a lightning blast, and then their theme song starts playing. Well, and, dude, mm-hmm. you, let let me stop you there because, yeah, they when when they finally head outside and they're confronting uh, the Minotaur, uh, they morph. It's morphing time. But and this is what I was bringing up earlier, because their weapons looked off. Their weapons didn't look like they did in the Power oh, Rangers series. Mean, do you mean the fact that? They had like a base form and then a yeah, ranger the form. Wep- the weapons morphed with them. I don't want to gloss over that. I haven't seen something like that. That was so cool to see that that when they transformed, their weapons glowed and transformed into their because uh, Goshi Stone Axe compared to his Ranger Axe because everyone's seen the Ranger Axe. If, or okay, if you've seen Power Rangers. You know, Zach's axe cannon, and it's this huge, big, heavy thing. So the fact that everything morphs into these ranger versions of it. Uh, Geki's sword becomes this cool, magnificent saber. Um, even the bow becomes a bit more, like, future techy, even though, obviously, it's still being linked to magic. But all this stuff morphed, and it was so cool to see. It, it very much lends itself to the whole... It's all tied together. These legends are tied together. These powers are tied together. It was so cool to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I, yeah. I, I... <laughs> <Fuck your point. laughs> no, I'm agreeing with you. I just didn't realize that's what you meant when you when you said it. But now that you mentioned, it, I'm like, no, yeah, they they transformed, and it is cool, and it's something we couldn't have seen because the Rangers didn't have a reason to have regular ass weapons. <laughs> Yeah, Jason wasn't exactly walking around with a regular sword uh, at his karate practice. Yeah, you didn't have a reason for them to have these weapons or for them to morph, because if you only saw them in ranger form, then yeah, you're only going to see their ranger form. So, yeah, and then we get another scene that, a phrase that really makes it seem as if they're somehow sentient. I believe Geki says, the weapons are screaming to become one. And yeah, they, they, form... start glo- they start glowing again. And, and yeah. And they form into Howling Cannon, which is just sounds cool. Uh, and so, you know, I forgot how much I love the appearance of the cannon. It's just, it's clean, it's effective, and it fucks shit up. So, they blast Dora Minotaur, and he goes, boom. Uh, but Ben Dora is still shaking. And then, because I guess she's not doing enough damage, she breathes onto it, and heavy winds start blowing. So all everything is going to hell. And at that point, Hiroshi's mom finds Hiroshi, and she starts crying on him, and it awakens him. Uh, and then, again, this is all in the last five minutes, so it's all happening real quick. Bandora just chucks the fucking 
right? He, no. I, I, no, yeah, I wrote Yeet and the Elite. Yeah. Because all she did is just, all oh, the Rangers, Bandor is still going nuts. They had no choice. They just kind of retreated back to the cave and kind of just huddled together, whatever they could. And Bandora throws the island, points her staffs at it, and blows it to hell. Yeah. But they get out in time. So Which I'm not sure how they got out. It just seemed I, at first I was expecting like maybe Barza did it something. They just kind of appeared in the in their actual world. Zayu Ranger doesn't give two shits about this so far. Jetman had a reason and had the scenes. This is too busy to tell us exactly how everything happens. Well, well you and it comes to one of the biggest crux in like writing magic. It's just that at a certain point people just say magic and that's how things happen. Yeah. Hey, man, why do you look like this now? Magic. Uh, you're not the right age. Magic. You're not the right species. Magic. Like, literally. So, at this point, I don't know, maybe they might go into something eventually, but as of right now, you don't need to know anything besides they got out. <laughs> so, they have the little reunion, you know, the rangers say their, their piece to the kid, and Bandora projects in to taunt them one last time. And then we get this, again, sentient weapons, I, I have to say it. Um, because they say, legendary weapons, you're our trusted friends. And it ends, and you get you get this great scene of them all posing with the weapons and the... I'm going to stop calling them Zords. They are not Zords. The Guardian, Guardian Beast. In the background. And that's the episode. Um, and it's a lot... A lot happened here. It Obviously, was very we, quick. We've been talking for <laughs> almost very, very quick, almost an hour, and it feels like it was just really jam packed. And so I feel they could have streamlined it, maybe, uh, maybe not have used Dora Minotaur. That might have made things go a little bit faster. But ultimately, it wasn't a bad episode. I, I'm glad they got their weapons. We got to see new aspects of it really cool fights um and better uh better character interactions uh well finally some character interactions. what what are, what are them. your thoughts on on the episodes as a whole looking at both of them together it is really interesting to judge because let's be honest it's just more it, it's it's team building but not focusing on the team players it's, it's, they don't have their equipment, so we're going to do this. Because first two episodes, again, wasn't about the Rangers. It was about Bandora. The Rangers were just the response, and we didn't really get to know them. This time around, it's more about them needing weapons, and it, it was we didn't really get to interact with them much. It very much still doesn't feel like it's about the Rangers yet, though we know what they're going to. And so because of that, it felt really quick because it was like we got to get this done we got to get this out because in, in retrospect you look at it you had two two parters back to back at the very start of a series which isn't something you do traditionally um yeah jetman by this point already you had your okay we need to become a team or we need to gather the team uh mm -hmm. that that was the first two parts of the episode here it's like we have the team but you need to solve this issue and then again we're in three and four but you need to actually be equipped for it like they have yet to be solid rangers it, um, it very much it very much is to me just again furthering stacking up bandora because they said we're just like we it feels off fighting without our weapons and we need it in order to face bandora and all of this just seems to be more and more legitimizing her and her power instead of establishing who these people are in general. Yeah, well, next episode we actually get to see some interactions. Normally normally we try to do three episodes. That has always been our thing beforehand. But with these two parters, I think it might be easier for us just to focus on that. Um so hopefully next time since we're out of um out of these two parters, we'll be able to do three episodes uh uh, a podcast. That being said, 
I said my wrap up thoughts. You said yours. I think no nope, other nope, thing we got we got one last thing. Oh, is it ranking Dora Minotaur? Because I want to do that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Did I just cut off? <laughs> no, were, no, no, no. We were if both you... at the same place. <laughs> hey, that works. Dora Minotaur. Where does he fall on the big scale of monsters? In the big scale of monsters, with Goldar being an S rank and Tomato King being an F rank, I gotta say. He's generic and he didn't do much, you know? Yeah, I was gonna say, I'd put him at least at a D. A D or maybe even an E. Just because his design, while it wasn't bad, it wasn't anything, it was literally just a Minotaur. It was nothing, it wasn't a Minotaur with a gun. It wasn't a Minotaur with. <laughs> <laughs> look, dude, no, look. We've seen in, in Jetman where it's just like, here's a rat with a flamethrower. Like, literally. It's just like here's a basic minotaur that you could see, like you said, maybe and maybe uh Attack of the Titans. You know I mean it it wasn't anything great, it wasn't anything new, and yeah. ultimately he was just fodder. He was like the monster of the day. The most exciting moments were seeing Goldar in these episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? You're right. Him. So I don't know. I feel like he wasn't terrible enough to be an E, like design wise. But he also didn't do it. You know what? I'm going to put him at E. E? His design wasn't anything special, but he wasn't a flat-out horrible thing like Tomato King. You know what? I'll accept it. E will have to be just the less than average. Like, you couldn't even hit that average mark, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't get... D for degree, you didn't even get that. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that that's a saying, but... D for degree, guys. Um, which leads us into our quote of the day. Uh, particularly applicable to my my university aged brother. What is yes. our quote of the day? Yes, yeah, so for everyone out there, whether your school is currently being postponed to everything, or if you're trying to adjust to online classes, this is from Geki, the leader of the Zayu Ranger. Red Tyrannosaurus says, listen to your mom and study hard. <laughs> and that's all I got for you today. All right. Night, folks. I'll see you next time.